<laughs> well, welcome. We have tonight a special presentation, The Rise and Fall of John T. Cardwell. And for those who don't know, there is, there's a couple of different colonies, they called them at the time, the uh, subdivisions that were developed in this area. The uh, first one that was developed was the Orangevale Colonization Company. They had the Orangevale Colony that was developed. Uh, but shortly after that, there was the Cardwell Colony, which we'll see is north of Oak Avenue uh, on this presentation. And uh, we had a, a different character who was involved with that. We also have the Santa, Santa Juanita Colony, which is a little strip of uh, parcels as well. And then the rest of it's all standard unincorporated lots that uh, have morphed over time with people buying and selling and splitting and merging. So with that, let's talk about uh, Mr. Cardwell. I'll be giving a little background on his life, where he came from, um, the reason for his move to California, specifically to Sacramento area. We'll talk about his community participation, uh, what I call the Daisy Affair. Uh, trying to make it more, well, it's it's pretty interesting story, so it'll be fun. Uh, his uh, mansion on Capitol Row, we'll talk about. Uh, we'll talk about, of course, the Cardwell Colony, which is one of the reasons why we're interested in this gentleman. And then um, his fall. So he, he was uh, pretty rich, as you can see from the mansion, but uh, he did not end well, so that will be interesting to see. This is a neat uh, little just example of from the gold rush when uh, in 1850 they were promoting trips over to California to go look for gold. Uh, this was just some eye candy I could put in the slides. One of the things with Mr. Cardwell is I don't have his photograph. I couldn't find it. <laughs> I have a picture of his house and so we'll see that but uh, it was really challenging to find any kind of photography or images specific to him. So I am uh, putting in some other stuff in here to uh, tell the story. So the shaping of John. Well, John was born in Ireland um, in around 1842. So depending on which census I look at or which registration of voter I look at, I've, it's been 1840, 1842, 1843. So there's, it bounces around a little bit and I think this is John maybe not knowing exactly when he was born, but he was born uh, right into the uh, potato famine in Ireland. And this was when they had a, uh, a mold or a, a disease that hit the potato crops. And there was uh, at least a million people that died of starvation during this period of 1845 to 1852. So he would have been a young lad during this time period. Um, I don't know if he was on a farm. We don't have any backstory on his family. Was he in a rich family? Was he in a poor family? Where he was? But he did survive the potato famine. Uh, he also, as a young lad, would have heard about the California Gold Rush. And we'll see based on his activities when he got here that that seems to be something that he was definitely interested in and why he picked Sacramento as his location to immigrate to. Uh, we see in uh, 1868, uh, he shows up in a roster from a ship that came into New York and down here you can see his name John Cardwell and he was about 23 years old. There, there were quite a few John Cardwells. It was almost like John Smith I guess for Ireland. <laughs> so when, when I was researching John T. Cardwell because his middle initial was T, even that you would end up with a guy in Kentucky who was John T. Cardwell or a guy in Oregon uh, so I had to be careful when I looked at stuff. So theoretically, there could have been another John Cardwell in 1868 that was on that boat from Ireland. But it's, this is a pretty good chance considering he did show up in Sacramento that very next year. And uh, based on his obituary, uh, he, he did go through the Isthmus of Panama. Uh, if you are not familiar with it, when the gold rush was going on, there were a few ways you could get to California from the East Coast or from Europe. So you would come into the East Coast, New York, you would either take a boat around the very bottom of Cape Horn, all the way around South America, and all the way back up. That was the longest route. Uh, you could take a boat down to Panama, the Isthmus of Panama, which was the shortest little spot where they put the canal, uh, and the canal wasn't built then. So they would 
go through the jungle. <laughs> so they'd get off a boat on one side, they'd hike through the jungle over to the other side of Panama, and then they'd wait for the next uh, frigate that would come by, they'd jump on, and they'd head on to San Francisco. Uh, and then the third way was, in 1868, this is a year before the Transcontinental Railroad was finished. So in 1869, May 10th, 1869, I happen to know that because it's 100 years before I was born, uh, <laughs> That's when the transcontinental railroads connected, and then you could just take the rail line across. But before that, you would have to take a wagon train across the Oregon Trail, the California Trail, uh, to come across the land route. So there was the three different ways you could get here, and he chose the Panama route. All right, he gets to Sacramento. So this is very quickly. So in 1869, he shows up right away um, registering for citizenship. He then gets his citizenship papers in 1871, and uh, he shows up with a marriage license in 1872 in Folsom. So he's in a bit of a hurry. Uh, <laughs> he moves right in, settles right in, and uh, gets things going. <clears throat> if you haven't been, there's a new um, research site. I've used Ancestry a lot, and that's something you can use for free through your Sacramento Library card access online. So if you've ever, as long as you don't want to save anything yourself, you just want to search the information, you can use your library card and you can use that for free. They have the genealogy section of the library. Um, but the other thing that uh, the, um, the Utah folks have been doing is they have what's called Family Search. And that's actually where I found these documents. Uh, it's called FamilySearch.org, I think it is. You can just sign in for a free account and it seems to have different information, has a different search function. So it's a little bit different than if you're used to Ancestry, but it's been pretty helpful. Found quite a few uh, documents that I haven't been able to find in Ancestry I found in FamilySearch. So just next time you're doing some research, also for our detective team doing research, uh, make sure you get your FamilySearch um, account, which is free, and check that out. But uh, on the left here is his declaration of intention. So this is when he, in 1869 said, I'd like to become a citizen of the United States. And at that point in time, he was a subject of the Queen of Great Britain and Ireland. So he had to note who he was subject to at the time when he was looking to switch over. And then he got his official Citizens of the United States papers in 71, pretty cool. And then finally, uh, they had a picture of his marriage license, so in Folsom. He got married to Mary Howe, and it was at the Rector Trinity Church in Folsom. So he did his paperwork in Sacramento, but he ended up in Folsom, which was still a big gold rush town, even in 1870, although it was getting much quieter. Well, after that, when he jumped in, he's jumped in pretty quick. He also jumped in from a community participation perspective. He uh, very quickly got into pole working, so he was a, uh, a judge, or they had different names for the people that were at the pole stations, but uh, he was doing the pole work at the Mississippi Township. Uh, he was in Ashland at the time, which is originally across from Folsom. Uh, that was Big Gulch, Ashland, finally Folsom swallowed it, and it's now part of Folsom. But uh, he worked there as a pole worker, I uh, see him uh, a number of times in the newspapers, him and uh, Lawton, a couple other names from the local area that were participating in the, uh, the election process, so that was, that was neat to see. He was also, back then they had a, um, a tax called the Roll pull, Road Poll Tax, and this was outlawed, I believe, by the federal government in 1917, I think I remember right. And what they would do, the different uh, jurisdictions would say, okay, we'll have a tax to support the road system for every able-bodied man between 18 and 50, and they have to pay $4 a year, or whatever it is. And so what would happen is these roadmasters would be in responsible for collecting in their district this road poll tax. And so they would go around getting all the guys and say, hey, give me your four bucks, or whatever it is. And uh, he was doing that for quite some time. He also was in charge, it seemed, of maintaining the roads as part of that budget 
and then they would go back to the Board of Supervisors and you'd see it in the newspaper where they would report on whether they needed more money or how much money they collected and those kind of things. So it was interesting to see that. One of the interesting stories out of that part of his life was he went to the Mississippi Bar gold mining area. It was mostly the Chinese community there at the time. And he was trying to collect taxes and there was this one shifty looking guy that was a little nervous and he was like, hey, you need to pay your taxes. And the guy's like, uh, I don't have any money. And well, you're gonna have to come back and get some money. And then he went back to doing his paperwork with the rest of the folks paying their taxes. And this guy came over, stabbed him in the back. Oh and he survived. <clears throat> but uh, that was some of the, the, I guess, precarious parts of the duty as a roadmaster was you might get stabbed in the back. <laughs> so very interesting. Uh, on the right here, he also was very quickly a landowner and uh, starting his own schemes of making money. Uh, in 1870, so this is a year before he actually got his official citizenship back, he's already showing up on the parcel maps as an owner of parcels near the San Juan Grant, or Rancho San Juan, which is our area here. Uh, so he was already doing that. And then in 1884, he ends up buying most of the San Juan Grant from Hastings, who owned it at the time, for uh, quite a bit of money, $28,000, I think, and at the time that's big chunk of change, but it also was a huge chunk of land, which we'll see. And he had a plan for that. Here is the 1870 parcel map. And over here you have Ashland and you have Folsom. Just to give you a reference, here's the American River. So Orangeville is in this general area in the Rancho San Juan. And he had a couple of chunks of land, you can see Cardwell over there, on the far left side, just outside the Grant borderline uh, at the time. So and we'll see how that changes here in a second. Just here, 1892. Here we are four years after the Orangevale colony has started. And down here you can see that they have Orangevale. Um, we'll talk about this later sometime. Hall Lures and Company own the top left corner of Orangevale at the time. But that's a completely different story we can talk about later. Uh, Mr. Cardwell, bought everything above and around Orangevale. In fact, he owned part of this and he sold a chunk of it to the Orangevale Colonization Company so they could have their nice square um, parcel map. <laughs> so he did sell them some uh, property to uh, do their, their particular uh, agricultural subdivision. All right, the daisy versus the bridge. It was a very, very interesting story. So one of his schemes uh, for uh, Mr. Mr. Cardwell <clears throat> was he bought all that land and it was covered with oak trees. I mean, oak trees everywhere, which is of course the Nisanen were using for food at the, prior to that. There wasn't many left at this point in time. Uh, and there was a lot of stone left over from the mining. Well, he's thinking, okay, I could sell the wood as firewood to Sacramento. So what did he do? He, he actually um, uh, got some guys to come up th into this property and they cut down all the oak trees. It's like uh, 9,000 cords of wood that they piled on the American River um, shoreline to ship down. He wanted to ship it down the river to Sacramento to sell for either building buildings or doing firewood and stuff. And I'm, it reminds me of somebody <clears throat> that uh, is like, what's that book? Is it, uh, oh, Saruman, right? Lord of the Rings. Remember he cut down all the forests, but yeah, that was way after that. But he might have been the inspiration, John Cardwell, for Saruman, perhaps, for C.S. Lewis, but I, di I digress. <laughs> uh, so he was thinking, okay, I'm gonna get this stuff down to the market, and I'm gonna make a bunch of money on these stones and on this wood. And he went with his attorneys, and he's like, hey, uh, is the river navigable, navigable, which means can you take a, an actual like freight ship, a ship where we can load cargo on, run it up and down the American River? <clears throat> and at the time, the California legislature had marked it as a navigable waterway, <clears throat> which has rights because it allows the ships a right of way on the river. So if anybody builds a bridge, they have to put in a drawbridge. 
to let boats by because it's navigable. <clears throat> well, he found that out. <clears throat> but the problem was the 12th Street Bridge, which is a toll bridge at the time, there were stockholders, they had a nice bridge there. It wasn't a drawbridge because nobody else thought it was navigable. But Cardwell was like, no, no, no. So he, he buys a boat, a, an actual rear paddle boat steamer, very similar to this. It was 80 feet long, 20 feet wide. So he buys it off the Sacramento River and he proceeds to drive it up to that bridge. <clears throat> and he drives up to the bridge, or floats up to the bridge, I guess. <clears throat> and he yells at them, make way. I, you know, this is navigable, to, you know, you're blocking my waterway. And uh, it goes back to Monty Python for me when the Frenchmen were taunting the Englishmen. You know, your mother was a hamster and your father smelt of elderberries. <clears throat> so they taunted him from the bridge and said, ha, 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 no, it's not going to happen. So what did he do? Let me read this to you. <clears throat> so he's got his boat up to this bridge. He ran the boat up to the bridge, dug a canal of such length that it would admit the steamer getting sufficiently inland to admit of land fastening for the ropes attached to the steam capstan and then hauled his craft ashore. With blocks and rollers, he then transported the daisy around the bridge on dry land. <laughs> and early yesterday morning, he made a successful launching of it about 200 feet above the obstruction. <laughs> that guy's got some cojones, or he's very determined. <clears throat> so he drags this boat around the bridge on dry land, puts it back in the river, and then, for his adventure, he invites the Board of Supervisor, he invites all kinds of dignitaries, everybody who was anybody in Sacramento for a party boat ride. So from there, he was gonna then prove to all the officials in the area that it was navigable. And so he then took them, along with um, hors d'oeuvres and drinks and music, all the way up to Folsom on the, uh, on the American River. They only got stuck a few times shortly, but there's this huge article, which I couldn't read the entire, this is just a little chunk of it, it's gigantic, about this adventure they had. And one of the unfortunate things that put a little damper on the day was there was one gentleman who got really drunk and he fell overboard and drowned. So they, they looked for him after dark, after they came back down from Folsom, but uh, they didn't find Mr. Johnson. But yeah, that was his big thing to prove, again, that this was navigable. And then he took it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Yeah. Um, so it's down here at the bottom, but the, the lawsuit started that same year in 1882. It took seven years to then push it all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. In the meantime, <laughs> while we was waiting for this court date, that gigantic pile of oak wood that was on the shore, 9,000 cords of wood, um, it mysteriously burned while he was out of town. But it was insured, so that was good. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's an advertisement in the paper from the insurance company that has a reward for the arsonist. We're looking for the arsonist to, to burned up the uh, Mr. Cardwell's pile of wood. But uh, not the an interesting gentleman, right? So he cuts down all of our oak trees here locally, and then they somehow burn up in a a mysterious fire not shortly after this whole incident. <laughs> so it was very interesting. He was out of town, of course, during this accidental fire. And then in 1889, they finally came back uh, after all the appeals up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and they said the American River is not navigable. It's a seasonal river, no boats. Yeah, no, nothing, no, no like large vessels. Um, can go on the river. So then the drawbridge was moot at that point. You didn't need a drawbridge and uh, life continued on. So very interesting story though. This guy had a few lawsuits and this was one of the very interesting ones that he uh, popped around at. But yeah, this is a cute, a cute little uh, paddle boat. This is one from Red Bluff. Uh, it's very similar to the Daisy in the way of the description from the article. And it was near a bridge, so I, I, I certainly wanted to use this picture. It was a fun, fun picture of these, uh, this paddle wheel steamboat. All right, let's move on to the Cardwell Mansion. One of the challenging things about some people that we research is there's so much material 
you're trying to figure out how to get this into 30 minutes. And for others, you're kind of stretching it to get that 30 minutes. Well, with Cardwell, I had to pick and choose, and we're doing highlights sometimes, because he, he was very active. There was lots of news stories about what he was doing. You know, his wife's preserves getting stolen from the mansion, that kind of stuff. Uh, I didn't get to cover, but I at least I got to mention just now. But uh, in 1890, uh, he'd gotten to the point from a wealth perspective that he wanted to build himself a nice mansion on the uh, Mansion Row in Sacramento. And at the time, this was right along the Capitol Park on um, that 12th Street, I think it is, or N Street, N Street. So his uh, particular property was at 12th and N, uh, the southeast corner. Uh, right now, that's all big like state offices, buildings, and whatnot. Um, this, I believe, got torn down in 1935. A lot of the Victorians along there got torn up. Um, you know, we just have a few left over, right? We have, there's a few mansions, examples of the old Victorian, but uh, I did do some uh, reading on Victorians, and it was, it was interesting. Uh, we'll have to do a whole other topic on it, but, you know, uh, w running water from, you know, they had a tank up in the tower. A lot of times they'd have these towers, and that's where their water tank was, so they could have gravity-fed water for flushing toilets and for the kitchen and whatnot. Um, they had the, um, uh, your, of course, the indoor plumbing bathrooms, the, uh, the way they were designed with uh, good sealed windows, all that kind of stuff. There was a lot of innovations in the Victorian period that were uh, very interesting to see, but nobody appreciated it in the 20s, 1920s. So by that time, people were just tearing them down. They weren't wanting to fix them up and renovate them. They just wanted something new. So we did lose a lot of those, and this is one of the ones we did lose. Uh, this was, again, downtown Sacramento, looking right at the Capitol. This is the view he would have had. Other than the trees would have been much, much smaller. <laughs> but here's, here's the Capitol. So um, back behind me would be his house. And he'd be looking across the street at the Capitol. Um, and so he was along that whole row of uh, Victorians. Very uh, interesting. So he, he spent uh, $15,000 on that. And in that day, that was a ton of money. We talked about the villa in Orangevale, which was a pretty good sum of money. That was $4,500 to build, uh, and it's still on Oak Avenue. It's a smaller structure, but still very ornate, and you had the, the East Lake um, architecture of the Victorian period. But uh, this one, of course, very grand. And then he added uh, wrought iron fences from a local uh, ironworking facility in Sacramento, which made the news because a lot of them were shipping it in from the East Coast or something. Now they had this local ironworking um, that was sprouting up in Sacramento. So that was a, a big thing with his house as they, he used the local uh, artisans for that. All right, wow, Cardwell Colony. That's what everybody's here for. <laughs> the, uh, so he had that big chunk of land we saw. He, he had like an L shape around Orangevale. And what he did was he, he was uh, in the 1880s, there was a big talk in Sacramento about, hey, we're out of the gold rush. We need to figure out something else to develop the local economy. We need to get people coming in here, build up the agricultural landscape. We got all this land locked up in these grants and you know nobody's working them. Why don't we break them up and let people come in and work the land and, and you know create product for, for us and for shipping back east? And uh, Cardwell, of course, his name was on one of those because he's one of the largest landowners in Sacramento County at the time. And he was considering it in uh, 1887. He started, I saw an article where he's talking about, hey, I'll I'll sell people, you know, 10 acres, 20 acres, whatever you like. It wasn't anything formal per se. It wasn't like he developed a, um, a subdivision, but he was starting to break off some pieces. But then the Orangevale Colonization Company came in in 1888, and they did it big, right? We've got a master planned community. You've got a, uh, an actual township subdivision in the parcel maps, and uh, they, they've got the uh, plumbing coming in, the water to uh, irrigate the crops. They had a, a, 
a large group of investors as part of the corporation, which is different from when Mr. Cardwell did. And uh, he saw that and he's like, wow, that's, um, that's pretty impressive what they're doing. They were pretty successful with it in 1888. And so by 1893, we see him making a parcel map of his own, making a subdivision. And uh, unfortunately, the US went into a financial crisis in 1893, which probably impacted this as well, uh, when I was looking at the different things going on in the country. Because um, he had only sold, uh, we'll see in a second here, uh, a few parcels by the time bad stuff happened. And instead of going with a large group of investors and stockholders and whatnot, and he decided to do it on his own. He just borrowed money from a B.R. Crocker, which he had borrowed money from before. B.R. Crocker, uh, Charles Crocker, of course, is from the, the railroad and the big four. Um, B.R. Crocker was, I believe, his brother. And he was uh, part of the organization, but he was a, a kind of a sub player. Um, I do see him a lot in papers foreclosing on people. So he was an investor and he liked to uh, make sure he got his money's worth. So uh, unfortunately, you'll see Mr. Cardwell gets to participate in that process. So here's the map. <clears throat> somebody from locally actually, I think Marilyn, you sent this to me. Uh, somebody had uh, gotten the uh, high quality copy of the parcel map, the subdivision plan from uh, the county assessor's office. And so we have all these uh, roughly 10 acre parcels, very similar to what Orangevale Colonization Company did. He's got uh, on the left side here, instead of Hazel Avenue, this is Columbian, all right? So here's Oak Avenue here on the south. Uh, so Orangevale is south of the line down below. So here's uh, Oak Avenue, here's Golden Gate. There is no cherry at the time. Um, you've got Peerless and Granite and uh, Mountain View. Isn't it just Mountain now? Yeah. It's just called Mountain, yeah, Mountain View. And of course, Cardwell, <laughs> he's got his own road there. But he got this all set up in 1893. He started promoting it himself. He just put advertisements in the local Sacramento paper. He had some rides out there to promote it and whatnot, but uh, it wasn't at the same scale that Orangevale Colonization Company did. I mean. They, We've talked about how they worked with the San Francisco Examiner and had the, the prize house with William Randolph Hearst. All right, we had that whole thing. So they got a bunch of people from San Francisco to start buying property. They were reaching out back east into Chicago to bring people in. Uh, I don't see that with Cardwell. Uh, he didn't seem to have the same. He was kind of hoping to, I guess, come on the coattails of what the colonization company was doing and say, hey, I'm right next door come on over, kind of like the fudge factory next to High Hill Ranch, if you've been to Apple Hill. Oh, come on, Apple Hill. Yes, you've been to Apple Hill. Okay, good. All of us have been to Apple Hill. <laughs> you, no. Yeah, there's a little, little fudge factory. It's right next to the High Hill Ranch, which has all the parking, has all the attractions and stuff, but the fudge factory is right next door. Doesn't it, I don't think it even has any parking, but they just um, siphon people off of the High Hill Ranch. And that's how they make all their money. I think Cardwell was trying to do that with the Orangevale Colonization Company. But uh, it didn't work out. Because when we see 1900, uh, he did the original development in 1893. By 1900, we don't see his name on these maps. We see B.R. Crocker. Uh-oh. Yeah, B.R. Crocker. So a big vast majority of this, all these check marks, is owned by B.R. Crocker. There's only a small chunk right down here. You got eight parcels that got sold. And then there's a couple over here for Mr. Irvine. But everything else is owned by Mr. Crocker. Dun 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 dun. So yes, B.R. Crocker didn't get his money in time. He uh, went and foreclosed on Mr. John T. Cardwell. He got the entire leftovers from the uh, development, and I'm sure uh, he did okay with that particular action. Of course, Mr. Cardwell didn't do quite so well on that, so that was unfortunate based on his um, planning, uh, perhaps the economy, uh, different things, and we'll see some things as we go forward. 
as you see this in, in this is uh, this happened in 1897. So the foreclosure was 1897. The parcel map's 1900. So when we look at some other dates here shortly, you'll see kind of see a pattern of what's going on with uh, Mr. Cardwell. So it was the, the 1897, so that was like four years after the Depression hit? Yeah. Yes, 1897 or 1893 was the U.S. Uh, financial crisis. So about four years it took to finally go into foreclosure. Yeah. All right, so the fall, here we are. Here's an advertisement for a three-day malaria cure in Sacramento Bee. Um, Mr. John T. Cardwell is the um, proud owner of this medicine and swears up and down by it for, uh, for this pharmacy. <laughs> and to me, that smells a lot like a paid endorsement. <laughs> uh, and this was in 1898, the year after he gets foreclosed on. Uh, so that was, it was interesting to see his name pop up in an advertisement for um, some malaria cure. But he was still hoping. Uh, he was looking for gold now. He had been looking for gold for a bit. And uh, he did some gold drilling in the early 1890s near the Placer County line. So up in his big chunk of land, there was some granite deposits. And he did uh, do some drilling sampling to see if there was any gold down there to see where he should tunnel if he was going to. Um, he never hit it rich there because uh, we don't have any stories about him coming back to, uh, to the richness of his past. Uh, we have him tunneling. He finds out he has a good source that there's, there's still gold in Folsom underneath the road <laughs> in Folsom. So he gets permission from the county supervisors somehow because he's been in with them for a while, right? And he starts digging a mining tunnel in the road, in Liedesdorf Road, in Folsom. And it took the business owners, like the buildings next to the road, they're like, wait a second, you're like digging our, you know, holes under our buildings that are gonna collapse in. And so they were all freaked out. And so they finally got an injunction from Mr. Judge Catlin, in fact, to uh, have him stop, cease and desist his uh, tunneling under the Liedesdorf Street. So another one of his plans to get rich was foiled. And that was actually in 1894. Uh, that was a year after he started the Cardwell Colony. So I'm, I'm thinking, well, did he know something? Like things weren't selling as fast as he thought, so I better find some gold to cover my bills. That's what I'm thinking about that. And then in 1907, uh, he shows up in the paper. He uh, got into a fight at a local tavern in Natoma, uh, where the spaghetti factory is now. Spaghetti cake factory. Spaghetti factory, yeah. cheesecake factory, spaghetti factory, yeah. There's <laughs> too many factories, it's just food. Uh, but yes, he got a ball, he had to, he had to post bail. Uh, unfortunately, I dug and I dug and I dug for a um, prison picture, uh, 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 what do you call it? Mugshot, mugshot yes. Uh, in the internet archives, they have the mugshot books from Sacramento, city and county from those years, and I was like, I flipped through every single page looking for him and I couldn't find him. So I suspect they only did mug shots because it was probably pretty expensive for people that were actually going into prison versus people that were just there for, you know, drunken or disorderly conduct or stuff. So, uh, but I was hoping to find his mug shot. That would have been spectacular. <laughs> so the end of JT, he was still hoping to reclaim his wealth. And um, unfortunately, in 1908, once prominent, tide churned and death claimed him in poverty. John T. Cardwell, at one time one of the largest property owners in Sacramento County, was found dead last, Tuesday, or last Thursday in his cabin near Clarksburg, El Dorado County, where he was resided for the last few years. Passed away in a shanty. These are all the great obituaries we got from Mr. Cardwell. John Cardwell, once wealthy citizen of Sacramento, found dead in a cabin. Very unfortunate demise. Um, from the obituary, his children were living in Oakland at this time. Uh, the house that they built in Sacramento, I don't have any information about, like, did they sell it? Did it get taken away from him as well? The other thing I, I haven't been able to find is anything on his wife. The last time she shows up is in 1895. Um, they had a, a birthday party for one of their daughters at their mansion 
and that came up in the papers. But uh, Mary just disappears. I don't have an obituary for her. I don't have divorce papers, which potentially could have happened in 1897. He seems to have gone off the deep end looking for gold, trying to get his riches back. So, uh, but the only people mentioned in his obituary are his children, not his wife. So that was kind of interesting. So if you do find anything in your searches, let me know, because I'm sure I could have missed it. So a summary of Mr. Cardwell, because we don't want to just end on that really sad note. Uh, the directories for Sacramento County, uh, they had pretty much everybody in them back in those days. And in 1893, he is shown up as uh, a farmer for some reason. Here he is at uh, 12th and N Street. He's in his mansion, but he's put himself as a farmer, which was kind of interesting. In 1899, in the directory, this is two years after he gets foreclosed on. He's now a capitalist <laughs> in Sacramento, which um, I don't know if he was trying to put on a front or something. It was kind of a social media <laughs> big smile. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very true, yeah. I can see the capital from my view, so I'm a capitalist, yes. <laughs> in 1900, he's just John T. Cardwell. No occupation, no nothing. 1905, he shows up in Orangevale as John T. Cardwell fruit grower. And then finally in 1908, the year of his passing, he's a miner. So interesting. Um, view of him from the directories and what he told them his occupation was at the time. So, so interesting story, Mr. Cardwell. Um, we thank him for the colony he put together. We're still enjoying that here, but uh, very interesting story with uh, this gentleman. So thank you so much for uh, listening.